Today, we're going to be talking about Serral's uh, ZVT versus Maru. You know what? We might go and check out one of the innovation games as well, if you guys want, depending on how long we spend on this replay. And uh, yeah, other, other shows we'll do later this week and next week. Stats, sick Protoss versus Terran. What else are we going to do besides that? Uh, okay, so stats, sick Protoss versus Terran. Um, Serral's Zerg versus Protoss. Serral's Zerg versus Zerg versus Dark. All of those, all of those matchups. We want to go through them all, but especially the Serral games are a big focus. We might look at Innovation versus Rogue, because I think he played some very solid Zerg versus Terran there. Even though Rogue did make some errors. And a nice quick third base. 28 supply on that third to ensure it cannot be blocked. So, uh, very straightforward build order, honestly. There's, there's nothing crazy here. This is like the most stock standard shit you've ever fucking seen. Now, why am I excited and why do I love this? Because there's a little build order guide, which I wrote at the end of 2015. It's called the Rule of One Gas. And it was a Legacy of the Void adaptation of a build that Snoot taught me in late Heart of the Swarm. Or maybe mid Heart of the Swarm. Somewhere around the middle. Somewhere in 2014. And um, I was like, you know what? This, this actually works perfectly with the economy of Legacy of the Void. And fuck yeah, it does. Uh, it's, it's like the best thing ever. Um, and Serral's still doing it and he's fucking destroying the world. He literally won GSL versus the world. And this was his go-to in a lot of his Zerg vs. Terrans. It's a great build. Yes, it's adapted a little. There's, there's modern adjustments. Um, uh, and people are going Hydras off the back of it these days. As Hydras are obviously much better in the last year or so of StarCraft 2. But, uh, it's, it's really cool to see people basically following the rule of one gas. Now, what is the rule of one gas, guys? Essentially, it is that you only mine from one gas until all three mineral lines are filled with at least 16 drones. So, what this allows is you to focus on minerals more than anything else. You're only getting zergling speed. This is the basis of the star. We're going to go back and look at a lot more details because I think that's the more exciting thing, especially for the high-level people watching. Um, but even even the even if you're 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 in gold or silver, you can absolutely appreciate the details and the beauty of what Serral does. So we're going to be backtracking and rewinding and, and focusing on these details. But for now, let's lay out the build. You're very mineral focused, so you basically just get a crazy amount of minerals. Why? Because you can defend any early pressure against Terran with just queens and zerglings. Queens and zerglings are mineral only units. So as long as you prioritize these three mineral lines filling up as quickly as possible, it allows you to build more defense of queens and zerglings. It allows you to build spores, which defends anti-air. And it allows you to build more drones, which of course blossoms into more drones. And since you're playing a zergling baneling style as your standard zerg versus zerg in this matchup at the moment, you can play roach styles, don't get me wrong, but at the pro level, it's almost all ling bane at the moment versus bio. Uh, because of that, you are able to get a big mineral boost. You can get an early fourth base and an early macro hatch. And that's important because in Legacy of the Void, you only get three lava per inject from each uh, lava inject. And that is an issue if you're going mass as Zerglings. You've only got three hatcheries. Even if you inject perfectly, there's going to be a certain point where you just cannot spend all your money. Because Zerglings need so much lava. So getting the fourth up early, getting the macro hatch very key. Now, as we're seeing here, Serral just, just fucking, he just blocks everything, man. He blocks everything. And he does this, and let's, let, let's go through. I don't want to watch the whole thing on normal speed. He basically just deflects the Hellions. His queens rotate. He keeps spreading creep in all directions. Gets a very quick fourth base. <clears throat> never takes this gas, or at least not for a very long time. Just because with Hydra Bane, to have the correct ratio of Ling to Bane, Ling Bane Hydra, you only need five gases uh, until you want to go up to hive and at that point you usually just go seven gases so you can skip this gas all game long something which i don't do uh most of all because i play spire usually but if i were to start playing hydras i would adapt that as well so i'm gonna, I'm gonna get to the point where sarah like fucking wins this game right let's let's go take a look look at this shit okay nice push banshee some marines a tank another tank's about to siege up Oh, what? Serral's already got a fucking flanking force there? Oh, he's gonna- he's gonna- oh, he's got Bane Speed finished as well off a rule of one gas? Holy shit. Sola has a build that shuts this down in a similar fashion, except he's at 55, maybe 60 drones at most. 
Serral is already building 13 drones and off the back of defending this, he's swinging in with a small counter attack, just 13 Zerglings. Jumping back on top of the next wave of assault. Oh! <laughs> and at the same time, did I mention he's over 80 workers before the 8 minute mark while shitting all over Maru? Serral's pretty good at StarCraft. Uh, the game's over from here. I don't want to be a hype killer. It's a much longer game. But this is the most textbook first eight minutes of a game you will ever see. Oh, I'll, I'll, I'll let the, the counterattacks with his lings and gets a few more SCBs as well. Bane lings roll in with some zerglings there as well. Finishes off a few low point SCBs. He kills 25 workers. It's it's 100% game over at this point, right? There's there's no way even Maru is getting back in there. And Maru is good at turtling on this map. But it stabilizes from there and Serral's basically won the game. Pretty straightforward. Now, why is this a good game to learn from when it's just a fucking ruffle stomp, right? He's curb stomping Maru to death, right? This is some American History X Zerg vs. Terran, if you know what I'm saying. We've got a very, very angry curb stomp going. It's it's disgusting, it's brutal. All the Terrans watching are like, fuck that shit, man. So let's let's wind back and let's look at some of these details and let's talk about it. So in terms of the the, the build. Very straightforward build, and Maru did one of the builds which a lot of the Terrans struggle to get consistent aggression with. But if you're Maru, your Banshees always find a drone or two, your Hellions, you know, pick off enough creep tumors, it's alright. Serral just keeps rolling through all of the early game. So let's go through and let's hone in on some of these fucking details, because there are just so many cool things he does. So, first of all, you pull off gas, one guy on gas, very standard build. Only four Zerglings, not six, pulls them back. Now, small note. A lot of pro Zergs will go for six Zerglings. Serral doesn't do that. Why does Serral not do that? He goes 16 hatch every game. So he actually has one less drone mining on minerals in the early game. He goes for a 16 hatch rather than 17 hatch. That allows his hatchery to finish a few seconds earlier, which means this queen pops a few seconds earlier. So she can shoo back that Reaper. Otherwise, he could potentially kill three or four of these Zerglings because you don't have two extra fresh Zerglings with hit points to kind of rotate on and chase off the Reaper. Okay. So the queen there just gives you that. It also means this creep gets started early. Notice it's a creep tumor straight into another creep tumor. Skips the inject on the natural. That's because if you're going to go for a very quick third, you don't need that extra lava inject. And getting your creep past a certain point against Hellion openings is the most important thing in the game. It is so, so important in this matchup, especially with this style. Because your queens and your creep spread is your power. This is how you get ahead versus Terran. It isn't by doing damage to them. It's simply by covering the map in creep and getting enough economy and enough bases up, all right? So this is huge. Serral here is gonna spread creep, a few creep tumors, did build a second queen almost immediately from the natural and started injecting. So effectively, it's only one inject that you actually miss to get these very early three tumors, one on each path. Not just that, look at the vision, guys. It's something I've been talking about for a long time. Serral has spotting overlords. So Serral can watch on the minimap and see which direction those Hellions are coming from. And no doubt, uh, in, if if he wasn't worried about having the vision down here for Liberators and stuff, would have probably put an Overlord there as well. Meanwhile, at the front, this Overlord was just chilling on the bit of high ground, and he's going to sacrifice it at 3 minutes 30. This is the crucial time. Same timing we've been doing since the beginning of Legacy of the Void. Uh, send it in at 3.30. He sends it in actually slightly later. And he just wants to see, hey, what's going on? Cool. Now, if there's no add-on there... He might change his tech, and I'm not 100% sure how Serral would play, but basically Serral sees the, the starport, sees the, the tech lab, says there could be banshees, goes straight for lair. Now, I think this is something Serral would probably do most games, and we're going to look at some of his other ZVTs and see if that's the case, because it allows him to get the fast bane speed, but most importantly, this allows him to get overseers. Now, there's something you need to know against banshees. A lot of people say, just build a spore in each mineral line, you're fine, but no. Because if you've got a spore here, I guarantee you Maru's Banshee comes in, kills two drones, flies off, only gets hit by the Queen twice. Banshee comes in here, gets two drones, flies off. So it's more important to have the Overseer. The spores are there as a sort of stopgap. It gives you a bit of a safety net, right? You can pull drones behind the spore. It stops Banshees coming in and just killing everything. Obviously, one Queen loses to a Banshee, just barely in a fight. So the spores are important, but it's the Overseers being ready and in position that allow you to just shit on the Banshee. So making sure, even if you wanted to go a late layer, if you see Banshee tech being a potential, you go for the fastest layer possible because you want to make Overseers. Let's swap to Serral's camera. As soon as that layer finishes, he makes an Overseer in his natural and makes an Overseer up there. That's his camera. 
He said, okay, I don't think he even noticed the Banshee come into his main, actually. But even if he did, he's like, look, I've skipped the Spore in the natural. Why? Because how is a Banshee going to get in here? It's got to go deep, and my Queens and Overseer are usually in a central location. So this base, I skipped the Spore. This base and this base, he got the Spore, and he cut them down to the last possible moment he could. He dropped them right on 430, I believe. Let's check. Let's check the exact timing of those Spores. Should be 4 minutes 30. Ooh, he's actually going to delay them really, really fine. Towing that line agreed. Oh, okay, so he, he knows the main is the more likely target. So his spore went down at 4 minutes 30 there. And it goes down at eh, 4 minutes 50 in the third base. Maybe 4.45 thereabouts. So he cuts, cuts the line with those spores. Says, look, we're just going to have them ready at like the last possible second. But this overseer morphing here. And he's probably added that to his defense control. Actually, he hasn't. He hotkeys it separately. What a beast. Comes forward. The Banshee overextending there. Appallingly bad. Loss for Maru. That... Friggin sucks. Not just that though, his Hellions have already been struggling to contain the creep. Because once they're spread out, these three paths, it is so fucking hard to contain it. Your Hellions are like, cool, we, we denied a creep tumor. And it's like spreading here. So you've got urgency to go back to the other side, slow down that creep. But while that's happening, Serral just gets in this rhythm where he's just like spread creep there, spread creep there, spread creep there. And he just does that super calmly. The fact that he morphed an extra Overseer up here in case the Banshee came from that angle was just like the sickest thing. He just shuts down the Banshees. Because he knows the Banshees aren't a threat now, he immediately sends an Overseer across the map to scout. And this is the other thing. Serral is constantly scouting to double check what his opponent's follow-up is. So at this point, what has he verified? It's a Hellion Banshee opening. There's a fast stim. You could see two extra barracks come down, a ton of marines, this swap onto a reactor, lots of medevacs. One way to check out what's happening is what's going on in the wall. At this stage, Terran does not have enough supply depots to fully wall their front. They've used two depots in their main wall. They need to use something else to wall off. So you're either going to see the engineering bay or double engineering bay. Huge tell that there's macro coming your way, right? A single engineering bay on its own, not necessarily. But you can also look at the engineering bay, see if the lights are flashing on them. Tells you if they're upgrading or not. Third CC in the wall. Biggest tell you can have. Maru's not going three racks. We know from this timing, he's going third command center immediately. So Serral just with a single Zergling that went around. He saw the Hellions were up here. He sent a Zergling around the south side of the map. Just kind of went. And he actually picked off the SCV building that, by the way. Um, there was just an SCV. It floated there. His two Lings came up to scout. And he said, oh, cool. Killed the SCV and delayed that command center. So Maru would have been pretty, pretty triggered by that. Um, yeah. And then uh, the queens do defend here as well. So this ends up being pretty damn amazing. Seven queens. So Serral doesn't do one of these like, I'm going to build 12 queens. My name's Snoot. And I love that efficiency. Because the queen's not a good mobile unit in the mid game. It doesn't do a lot of damage. It doesn't get over there. Caleb, thanks to the 11 month resub. No worries, son. Get into Challenger again. Make daddy proud. Post requisite. Thank you for the six-month resub as well. Welcome to the pigsty, guys. So this is just a straight-up build. A uh, small little thing about the rule of one gas. Just something that's cool. Good to see. Uh, a mechanical habit here. So one thing you're going to notice is Serral basically rallies his bases to his newest base. As soon as this base hits 16 drones, he rallies everything to the third. And uh, we're going to hit this point real soon. So let's go to Serral's camera. Let's slow it right down. So... Oh, actually, it's already there. I've got to go back five seconds. So Serral now is going to take gases. And this is a point where a lot of people get really lost with where their drones are going. Because you've got to take so many gases at once. Now, it's super easy because he doesn't take this gas. But normally what I would do here at this stage, if I want to take gases, rather than having all my new drones flood out and ending up with 30 drones here and having to grab drones from my third and send them back here, what you want to do is as you take gases on a base, because you've hit this 16 drone saturation on all three bases it's time to take your gases you go through your bases and you say take a gas and change the rally point back to the minerals take the gases change the rally point this one's already got its rally point to its base so just take the gases and you're going to see Serral do exactly that so at this point he's going to be like cool pick that off me queens are running around let's go gases gas gas clicks the hatchery changes the rally point you don't even get to see it because he does it so fucking fast man <laughs> But he did it just then, okay? And then there as well, took the gases. So he changed the rally point. He clicked the hatch, right clicked on the minerals. It's it's really fucking hard to catch it when you're on his camera because he does shit really quickly. Um, but trust me, he's doing it. Um, thanks guys or gals. Oh, don't be one of those people that thinks guys doesn't apply to girls. I, I like guys as a as a, a a universal word. I don't I don't I don't like guys as like a just meaning men. That's I just feel like it's a very universal word. 
but maybe maybe that's me. I've heard a lot of people who are like, oh no, guys, I mean girls as well. And I'm like, isn't it the same? I don't know, I call a lot of my friends that are girls, guys. I'll be like, hey guys, what's up? How's it doing? The only time I, I feel like it has like an inherent male by like, like uh, you know, attachment is when you say, I'm hanging out with the guys tonight. That's like the only time I get that. I think guys is super universal. <laughs> I'm not even, I'm not, I, 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 just, I just don't like people trying to fix attachments to words, man. I like using guys all the time, all right? It's one of my favorite words. I don't want it to be stolen. I'm gonna have to learn how to use vocabulary, fuck that. So here's a cool move, guys. Whenever the Banshee comes in, boxes the drones, clicks them away. Moves the queen there, Banshee flies off. All right, put him back on the gas. Super chill, super chill. Look at this upgrade timing, guys. So, for all you, all you Diamond Zergs out there, all you Master Zergs, all you Grand Master Zergs, I find Platinum players are probably better than this on you guys on most part. Can you guys stop making Evo Chambers at three minutes into the game and making the fastest, fastest 1-1 one -one upgrades, having no queens and zerglings or drones and then dying to a few hellions running into your base. Can you stop? Cyril, one of the greediest boys in the world, he's, he's, he's the guy sitting on a big bundle of money. What does he do when he sees hellions? He doesn't make his upgrades till six minutes. Six minutes, all right? Doesn't start these Evo Chambers till 5.30. So this is something I've been trying to tell people for the longest time. Hellions, Banshees, what can come off this? Even after you scout the tech lab, there could be Liberators. There could be a Hellion drop. He could just build a Medivac. He could be Faking Cloak. There could be eight Hellbats rocking up at the front. What do you need against that, guys? You need more Queens. You need more Lings. You need to rebuild the drones that are dying to the pressure. If you invest in enough gas to get 1-1 one, one at the three or four minute mark, if you invest in that many drones on gas, you're not gonna have enough Queens. You're not gonna have enough Lings. And that puts you down a, a rabbit warren of investing in tech too early where you never get up the third mineral line. Without the third mineral line, you never get up the fourth base. Without the fourth base, you can't nonstop produce Ling Bane and you find yourself forced to try to rush into Hydra tech and hope the Terran doesn't hit a sharp timing because Hydras suck until they get their upgrades and until they get in a decent number. And even then, they usually need Banelings to help them out against Bio. So a lot of players out there are just kind of trying to rush Hydras, hoping the Terran doesn't hit a crisp timing. Sometimes it works out, they get in a really good spot, they get a lot of Hydras and they go, cool, ZBT is easy. Other times they get totally destroyed by, by a Liberator rolling in, a Hellbat pressure, anything like that. So it's something where against Hellions, especially, like maybe against the 2 -1 -1, you can go fast upgrades. Maybe against any sort of, you know, more Marine focused build, right? Something where they go very fast three command center off just three or four, off just like four Hellions and they swap the factory off straight away and there's no starport. You scout that, you can go fast upgrades, but otherwise it's a huge risk. And it's something that Serral just knows he cannot squeeze into his build safely. Now at this point, Serral is worried about a tank push sieging up there, but he's also worried about out here. These are the two angles. That's the siege tank angle, that's the siege tank angle. So clearing the rocks, but not just that, I'm about to show you guys the sick perversion of a young Finnish man, all right? By the name of Juna Stala, which I'm probably butchering how you pronounce his name. Uh, Draenor, welcome to Pigsty with a four month resub. Thank you so much for hanging out. So this guy is, I'm saying he's sick and perverted because if you're a Terran player and you're a little bit shy, maybe you don't like to wear uh, one of those tops that shows like your belly button. You, what, do, what do we call those? The tops where your belly button is showing. Maybe, uh, you know, maybe the back's open. You're showing your back. Maybe maybe you're someone who likes to wear the skivvy. You don't like to show a lot of skin. You're not as, yeah, crop top. You're not as comfortable in your, your body, maybe. Maybe you're just not as exhibitionist, all right? I think there's a lot of Terrans who like that, right? D. Goffman, welcome to Pigsty. So a lot of you guys have that same attitude as me, right? We, we like to, when, when I'm playing Terran, I like to cover up, all right? I don't like my opponent to see everything. Cyril is a pervert. He sees everything. So we talked earlier. He came in with the Overlord Scout. Three minutes 30, sent it in, saw this upgrading. Then, after he killed the first Banshee, he dispatched one of his Overseers, came in, saw there was a three barracks transition. Even before that, two Lings poked the front, saw the third command center was down, knew it was an economic build, not a two base all in. Now, a Zergling sees when he's moving down to take the third, even harasses the SCVs, causes a nuisance. He's fucking seen every single thing Maru has do, done at every point in this game. And this is why a lot of players were going Viking first for a while. Look at this. 
More perverts coming in. Maru's like, stop looking at me. Stop looking at me. No, it makes me uncomfortable. And then look at this fucking guy. Look at the eyeball. Look at the eyeball. Look at it. Look at it. Look at it. Oh, the eyeball sticks up out the top of the head. And he sees Serral's entire push come out. He goes, Marines, tank. Okay, and there's going to be some Hellions. And he's like, that's cool. <laughs> and Serral here. Wait. Oh. Do we not? No, we can't. We can't get the hotkeys on here? No? Oh, I've got to actually go into the camera view, do I? Oh, there we go. It works now. So, um, he doesn't keep his counterattack hotkeyed, by the way. For Serral to control this, he just clicks on the minimap, boxes them, and micros them around, all right? Serral just has two army groups, and notice how he's already split them in two. As soon as he saw that push come out, he grabbed a big squad of Ling Bane, mostly Zerglings, because he knows these need to be able to kill tanks quickly, but enough Banelings to create a problem as well. His Bane speed's just kicked in, because he went for Bane speed very quickly when that lair finished. He really prioritizes that. Something we, like I said, Solar has a style which gets Baneling speed out for this sort of push as well, but he has a much smaller economy with it. Whereas Serral manages to do both, because he's Serral and he's a god. So his Overseer saw that. His Overseer sees the Hellions aren't with the push, and Serral just says, ah, oh, well normally I'd commit to the counter. And the thing is, I don't think Maru even realizes that's there, or he, or he didn't notice it, because he was going down here, and he, this thing blocked his high ground vision. He couldn't see it. So he doesn't realize that Serral's like, oh, I'm just not going to send that in. I know you don't have the Hellbats there, whereas the armory's about to finish. If these are up front, even in Hellion form, but especially as Hellbat form, they can do a lot. So Serral just says, that's fine. I've got my flank ready. I'm going to get you. I know this push isn't that scary. Why? Because I've been mass producing units off 70 drones. So essentially three bases saturated. This is the general rule I tell people. And what you should apply at your league if you're not Serral. So if you're at any league below Serral, is do not drone the fourth base until you fuck up a Terran push, until you crush it. Serral, he understands the early game went well. He took zero damage, remember. He took literally no damage. He has killed. He's lost no drones. He has droned like a boss. He has killed a Banshee. So he knows that he is a bit ahead from where you would normally be. Normally you'd take a bit of damage, right? And you have this kind of balancing bar in your head of where am I, where am my opponent? And if you think the game is very standard, you have a standard rule, which is don't drone your fourth base. In this game, Serral says, I killed the Banshee, that puts me a bit ahead, and I took no drone losses, that puts me a bit ahead as well. These aren't massive leads, but he says, because of that, because I've got a little bit more creep, because I've shut down the pressure easier, and I've got a bit more control, I can drone a little bit harder. And because of that, Serral squeezes seven drones onto his fourth. But no more than that. It is non-stop Ling Bane production. Hell, he's even adding an extra queen in here, and he's just getting ready. And the moment he gets rid of the next threat, only then will he drone his fourth base. But God, he's ready to do it. So he goes in here. His queens go in first. Very important because they're taking siege tank shots, which you can quickly transfuse. Effectively does no damage. The Banshee is fighting the queen. It's effectively adding no damage. Queens aren't important. They don't do damage. All they're there for is to soak damage. These Lings and Banes come in from behind. Should we go to the, the, the Finnish man's camera? And you can also see what he's selecting underneath me he's just he's just f2 and they moved and then he then he microed some rings around yeah to try and wrap around those 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 dudes so yeah it was pretty basic he didn't need to do anything fancy but then he says oh that's a bit of a scary position pull him back wait what the fuck aren't we on his camera let's watch this from his camera one more time there are these weird moments. Did he F2 to get his counterattack to move in? I think he might have F2 to get his counterattack to move in. He didn't F2 here. He just selected his two control groups. Does he even look at that counterattack to send it in? I think he does. He must. He must click up there. Okay, he does. Good. So he clicks on his minimap. He boxes it. He clicks it into the natural. He goes, puts down an infestation, starts 13 drones, goes, clicks that into the mineral line, and then just lets them do their thing, gives them an A move, and he says, oh, you're distracted there, let's create distraction here. He wasn't sure this would be a great fight, but he knew that if he just went in and forced Maru to stim and stutter step there, it would distract him from dealing with the counterattack, and would give his counterattack a higher chance of doing damage. So there should be a lot of this, um, whenever you're counterattacking a Terran, you should always posture at their main army. So you basically jump on their main army, as long as it's not a giant siege tank spread, and you say, Ha! Ah, Hislings and Banes! And then if they're not watching because they're distracted by the counterattack, you, you actually commit and you roll in and you kill a lot of marines because their splits are a little bit off. Or, or maybe they don't split at all, depending on your league. 
If they do react and you realize it's going to be a bad fight, you quickly just run your army away. You lose a couple lings, maybe a couple banes, but then you look at your counterattack and because they've been busy stimming and spreading at the front, they haven't reacted, that's killed an extra 10 SCVs. So whenever you can create a problem in multiple areas, you tax your opponent's APM. You find a way to just, just mess them up like that, right? And Serral always does that. He always has those lings ready to counterattack. Now, um, if he was under more pressure, he would have brought those lings back to shut down that push even harder with those lings coming in from the north. But he was so confident he had enough units, he didn't even care. At this point, Maru says, Stop looking at me, you pervert! And finally gets rid of that overseer. But uh, yeah, at this point, Serral's pretty much won the game. So I, I just think this is so exciting because there is just such a fucking pattern to how Serral does this. It's so clean. So clean. It's, it, it's basically just rule of one gas, drone up to X point, defend with queens, but it's all the little adjustments. What are the little adjustments? It's him scouting so methodically. So he always knows what his opponent's up to and he has preset things he's looking for at different timings. So let's go back and, and quickly review the scouting, guys. Step one, three minute 30, scout with the Overlord. Overlord was actually back there. Overlord goes in, goes for a sacrifice. 350, I guess he actually sends it in a bit later, doesn't he? 330 is a good number to remember, but yeah, if you prefer four minutes is good. Scouts with that. Next step, send a Zergling out, or in this case, two lings. Check what's in the wall, because that's an important piece of what they're doing. They don't need enough depots to wall off yet. That tells them what's going on. Step three, Overseer, go across the map. Confirm what the follow-up is. Are we looking at uh, mech transition or bio? That's the main thing you're looking for. The moment you see those barracks, you know there's a double engineering bay. You don't need to scout that. There's nothing crazy it could be, right? It's just like, no, yeah, you're just doing marine tanks, same as always. Hydroling bane, standard. Um, standard comp will do. Next, he says, I want to see when you move out. I've got a ling on your third to see when you land that third. Here comes some more perverts. Now I'm going to perv in this little spot and see when you move out. And this is like such a clever little spot. Does Maru, Maru does see it with a medevac, but he yeah, doesn't want to waste time cleaning it up. So Serral just throughout the game has this like nonstop vision. It's, it's gross. It's actually gross. He's a massive pervert. I love it. Um, and that's what Zerg's about. It's about if you can identify what your opponent's doing, you can choose the exact right amount of drones, then make army units, then crush push, then go back to drones. And that's exactly what this whole early game was. That's exactly what this whole early game was. It was very straightforward. It was just this, I drone up to a certain amount and then I, then I, then I just screw you over. Let's watch this fight one more time and let's just see if we can go deep. So queens go in first and he boxes these zerglings at the top and he clicks them here. So these Zerglings, he's just boxed these ones, and he's clicked there to try to stop the Marines from getting into the medevacs. Next, he control clicks. Oh, no, no, he's selected everything. He's just selected his whole army there. Um, just by, I think it was a box, but it might have been one. Just just select group number. Ah, yeah, I think he added his, his third. Okay, he added his extra group into his main army just then. Check this. So notice he's got 33 units on control group 4, 34. So this is group th 4, and this is group 1. But what he does here, check this out. In the middle of the fight, he says, I actually want to rejoin my army. And if there's one dude who is more fluid with his control groups than anyone else, he doesn't F2 very much. Uh, as much as I, I wish he would. Right there, as he A moved, he actually... So he, he A moved both armies, and then he... So he went... Number one, so Queen's A moved first. Five, A move in or move command in. He then went number one, A move, number four, A move. All in quick succession. But right after giving the A move on number four, he's also gone shift one to add it back into his main army. So what we see now is he boxes those lings. He tries to cut off these Marines. He then selects his main army group and just kind of A moves it. Nothing fancy going on here. Let me double check that one more time. Let's see if there was any other little maneuvers in there. I don't think there was. Queens get selected, which he told to target the medevacs there, because he was trying to stop that getting away. He was ignoring the banshees, he was targeting the medevacs. And then he kind of chases, and then he just selects them all, pulls back, boxes those units, clicks them into the natural mineral line, infestation pit, 13 drones, clicks those in, and then he says, ooh, let's create a distraction on the front. Wait a second, this is actually a decent fight. He control-clicked his Banelings there. It was very quick. You have about half a second to see that. 
And this is something you should always do towards Hellbats. Uh, whether it's mech or bio, if you've got a Bane Banelings in your comp, it's very... Okay, that rewound 45 seconds when I told it to rewind 5 seconds. Thanks, replay. Thanks, replay. It's all good. Here. So what you're going to see is he's going to control click those Banelings in a sec. So he's A-moved his whole army. He just A-moved there. He just scrolled up, A-moved, and now he's going to control click the Banelings. There we go. He's just control click the Banelings, and he's going to start clicking them down here. Yep, that's his click right there. You can see his click mark. So he's saying, Banelings, get the Hellbats, get rid of them. you got to go blow up on those light, those Hellbats. Hellbats are light units, so Banelings wreck them. Which is very standard micro um, if you want your banelings to run towards the enemy. Now one problem I see sometimes is people engaging into a big pre-spread of Terran. And they try to do that exact same, let's control click the banelings and move command them in. If the, the bios spread everywhere, you don't want them to all go in one direction. You might box a few banelings and say, hey, chase that clump of marines, box a few banelings. But if you tell all your banelings to chase one group of marines and all their shit's like in this big spread, you kind of end up basically just running all your banelings like just into a, a big spread and all their units are like gunning you down and your banelings kind of end up in this kill zone in the middle of their army where the marines and marauders and everything is spread around you so in big fights where they're very well set up it's important to not do that micro and to just kind of have your units flanking preferably but just to a move and let them kind of do their own thing so um yeah what could maru have done better this game not build the Banshees after it was scouted? I mean, there's always a mind game with that. Uh, he definitely needed to keep the first Banshee alive. Losing the first Banshee is... It's kind of like losing the first Oracle. It's uh, it's really, really terrible um, for you as the Terran player. So, yeah. I think losing the first Banshee, like committing onto the Queens, was a big gamble. It's a sort of gamble which pays off for Maru a lot of the time. He's not afraid to take these gambles. But it was a big gamble. So the thing is, like, this Banshee, I think, should have picked off two drones in the main base. He was very conservative with it. He cloaked, then he just turned around. And I was kind of like, wait, why aren't we just picking off a drone or two there? I mean, he could have come down, picked off one or two drones, then pulled back. But because he's already activated Cloak in a bit of a panic, I think it was. I don't know if it was a misclick. He's like, oh, well, I've got to use it before Cloak runs out. Quick, hit the middle. Probably doesn't have an Overseer yet. Maybe it was because he saw the lair wasn't done, actually. Oh, it must have been that. Hey! Ah, oh, so that's Maru's response. So this timing is so good for, for fucking Sarah. Look at this. So the Banshee comes in. <laughs> is like, wait a second. You don't have a lair. Two seconds. It's like four, four seconds from finishing. So he's like, quick, we can fuck up the Queens. Hellions and Banshees, group up, go straight for the Queens. And there's already an Overseer morphing. Oh, he like... <sighs> if it was even five seconds later, like this, this goes a lot better for him, you know? Because the Queens suddenly have to run away, which allows the Hellions and, and, Ban and Reaper to get more damage in, you know? But then he's like, oh, so he loses that. Oh, that's disastrous, man. That's so bad. And he's like, other Banshee comes in. It doesn't really do anything. Um, so, like, his other Banshee comes in, and Serral just responds so well. And it's partly because the pressure is so eased. Once you, once you get rid of the first Banshee, it's like, second Banshee just does, does nothing, you know? Tries to cancel the hatch. The Queen's like, no, get out of here, man. This is just a bad opening for, for Maru, um, where Serral's kind of gotten on top of everything, shut it down, so, so things have just ended up not being very good for Maru. Um, also, when he does do his push, it's, it's an ambitious push. Uh, pushing with siege tanks at that time arguably is a really big mistake. So he didn't have enough gas when he tried to start combat shields earlier, so that's why it's not ready for this push. You're meant to have combat shields with this push, which is big. You're also meant to have the second siege tank. He was like, fuck it. I'm so good. I'm just going to push now. I'm going to catch him being greedy. I know this guy, kid's greedy. I'm going to get him. Going to get him now. We're going to slow him down. We're going to take a good trade. Even if you lose this army, it's not too bad, but you got to like kill most of the Banelings, take a good trade. Problem is, look at the trade at the end of this. That ain't a good trade. This is this is before the counterattack. The counterattack obviously takes things to a whole new level. But uh, yeah, that's, that's essentially it. <clears throat> He wasn't expecting Sero to have such incredibly disgusting macro. Hellion Banshee is the build which suffers from this more than any other opening. If you lose your first Banshee, or if your opponent is very pristine in their defense, Banshees do not look good. I would argue that going Banshee against Serral is actually terrible, and that is because Serral is a god. So there, there are a few things I learned 
over watching GSL versus the world. Number one, Terran is bad. <laughs> it's, it, it's EVT. When you watch Cheryl's games, Terran looks bad. And I don't actually think that's a balance issue. It's a Cyril issue. Um, part of it is because even Liberators and stuff, he shits on. He just shits on the opening pressures so much. I'm waiting for someone to surprise him with a Hellion drop and, and find find it a hole in this guy's defense, right? Uh, the other thing is Oracles suck. So Oracles and Banshees are kind of the same. They're this fragile, high micro, fast unit. Comes in, kills some units, get out, gets out. They never kill any drones against Cyril. Like, consistently in Cyril's games... The first Oracle or Banshee gets a single drone kill at most. It is ridiculous how much momentum you get as a Zerg player if you're already towing the line of greed and yet somehow his Overlord positioning is just pristine. There's just those little moves like preemptively morphing the Overseer. He didn't know where the Banshee was coming from. He had no idea where the, where the Banshee was coming from. But what did Cyril do? Cyril goes and makes a second Overseer up here at the top of his third to stop a Banshee coming in and picking off some drones on the edges. He purposely has two Overseers. He skips the Spore Crawler there. He's got all these little moves, not just that, against Protoss. Every time the Oracle comes in, it doesn't matter what, what angle, his Overlords are spotting. He's got this ring of vision around his bases, right? He's always got the vision on the edges to spot the Liberators, to spot the drops or to spot the Oracles, and his Queens get in position. And not just that, he'll always box the drones, run them to the other side of the mineral line. We saw that when the Banshee comes back in here. He's always so quick at this. Why? Guess what? It didn't cloak. It moved into Overlord Vision. Cyril had a heads up. He saw that on his minimap, the red dot, before it cloaked. Just pulls these back. It's like, no, you're not going to get any kills. Get out of here. And that is just such a... It's, 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 it's brutal, man. It's brutal. How many workers does the first Banshee need to kill to pay off? You know, there, there's no set number. Um, you you want to get at least a few kills. Uh, partly it comes down to response, right? So if your opponent builds two spores per base, has ten queens, you don't need to do any damage because they've way overreacted. But in a standard sort of setup like this, you want to, over those two Banshees, either, if you go for the queens like you did here, kill a whole bunch of queens... Uh, kill a whole bunch of, uh, of units, um, Zerglings, cre get the creep knockback, or you want to get in and kill a bunch of drones. First Banshee would love to kill three drones, even just two or three, already slows them down, puts a little dent. As long as you keep the Banshee alive, you don't need to get as much, but if you don't kill any drones and you lose the Banshee, it's like the double, the double shit, right? You kill two drones, you keep the Banshee healthy, you rotate to find a new angle a little bit later, totally fine, that's okay, the Banshee's still alive, you're gonna find another drone. Find another drone. Pick off some creep tumors while your Hellions are clearing creep on the other side. That's that's all good. Your Banshee is still getting value. But if you just get it snapped like you did this game, zero direct damage. What did it do? It forced a transfuse. Queen energy. Who cares about queen energy at this point? Cyril's creep was already all over the place. So maybe Maru should have done what we see a lot of Terrans do when they're behind against Zerg at this point. Now, what is that, guys? That is, you only send out the marines and the medevacs, you leave the tanks at home, you just turtle up for now, and you say, just wait a bit longer, send the marines, scan, clear creep, the Ling Bane runs forward, we pick up, we boost over here. Scan, clear creep, pick up, boost, run away. Do that, that's like the, the you know, the zero threat pressure, um, but it doesn't really force a big response from the Zerg, that's why Serral wanted to push for this. But look at this fight timing, his one, okay, his one one does kick in just in time, but no combat shields. The flank makes the marines near useless because they were a little bit too deep on creep and they get flanked. And losing your first two tanks is, is pretty terrible. So he lost the, loses the Banshee there as well. And from there, it's pretty much game over. Now, I'm going to eight times speed it. And um, whoops. Whoops. We'll, we'll glance through some of the later game stuff while I keep answering some questions and chatting to you guys. Are there any guidelines on how much to drone bases on how much aggression you scout, says Dinoch. Um, I talk a lot about the idea of a safe lead, Dinoch. So you need to analyze each game individually and be thinking about what is a safe lead. And it depends on the situation. So in general terms, the most generic answer I can give to that question is you as a player should think about, okay, my opponent's on two bases. I want to get a third base and half saturated. Eight, eight, or, eight or nine drones on the minerals. And that's a safe lead in an even game, right? Um, obviously, against the Terran, you might want more than that because they've got mules as well. Against a Protoss, if you're on a very low-tier army and they're on a very high-tier army, maybe that changes as well. Maybe, the, maybe, maybe you want to say, well, because they're investing in more tech, I'm investing in much lower tech. Maybe I should change it. 
Maybe things, maybe I should uh, adjust where I think that that idea of a safe lead is. So there's a lot of things that weigh into it, but it all comes down to you starting to learn to look at understanding the game state and where you are, where your investment is in economy, where your investment is in army, and where your investment is in terms of tech or upgrades and how those balance out. So also, if you're ahead in a game, you can push one of those a lot further. The idea of where a safe lead becomes even deeper. You can go 20 or 30 drones ahead if you're already way ahead in the game. You can you can push that lead further and build upon it. And that's why if you fall behind in a game and your opponent's a high-level player who knows how to adjust, they can take advantage of that situation uh, because they can push their economy even further with that freedom they've been granted. They say, yeah, normally I wouldn't drone this much, but I'm ahead. I can drone this much because I'm way ahead in this specific game. So the idea of a safe lead has totally shifted due to the different nature of this game and the different kind of trades and situations that take in place. <clears throat> Why doesn't Serral rate make ranged upgrades earlier? Are melee upgrades more important? Yeah, so this is primarily a Ling Bane style. Now, if you're playing Hydras into Infestors and you're going lots of gas, mass Hydra, that's a different story. But you're going to notice Serral goes... 10 to 20 hydras, very rarely above 20 hydras. So it's mostly a Ling Bane style. Remember I talked earlier about how you don't take this gas in the main base until much, much later. Why do you not take that, that gas? Because you want to have more Ling Bane and the hydras are there to support. They're there to add range damage. They do decently versus all units. They definitely benefit from upgrades. But the way Serral and most pros play this is they will add ranged. You see he's already queued it up. Oh, he's, sorry, it's behind me. Trust me, he's queued up ranged upgrade from when his plus three melee was like halfway done. He already was like, yeah, let's make sure I don't forget range. And he already queued it up. So he is going to get into them, but the Ling Bane and then the Ultras and the Broodlords, these are his core damage dealing units. It's also something where if you go into those ranged upgrades and you're stuck on just Hydra and Festa, you get to a problem where if you want to go tier three, you got Ultras or Broodlords. If you don't have melee upgrades, those units are not nearly as good. Broodlords especially need melee upgrades because if you've got plus three armor bio, your Broodlings just don't do any damage to them. But if you've got plus three melee Broodlings, they're freaking fantastic for chewing their way through everything. So it's really important to always get melee if you want to be using Hive Tech. Now, in this game, uh, it could be argued that Serral definitely is kind of like letting Maru back in the game. But there's one thing Serral's amazing at. It's playing the most patient, calm, multi-prong, trading on two sides game ever. He keeps spreading creep. He keeps re-spreading creep. He doesn't take any damage. He keeps an obscene economy of 85 drones. He banks up a lot of resources. He has another pervert back here, by the way. He loves his perverts. Keeps sending changelings in. And let's look for how he finishes in this stalemate scenario where his opponent's got Ghost, Tank, Lib, is adding double armory for like the, the flyer upgrades. And he just says, uh, when you spread out, I'm going to take a fight. Comes down here and he says, hmm. And he's thinking about how he can take a trade. Now... It's one of the hardest things in the world is if you've got vipers on both sides. So he actually just puts all of his vipers down here. So this army up here, not as versatile, just a bit more of an A-move army. But he's just like, all right, screw it. Let's just roll through. Let's abduct these tanks to their death. And this army up here is still very frightening. So he's just kind of like looking to spread him out, get what damage he can, pick off SCVs where he can. And he's just going to keep taking these little trades, right? You don't really want to take a great big massive fight. Spread some Banelings out to kill some Widow Mines. He's like, oh, you're nuking me. Nope, gets on top of that. And he just stays on Ling Bay and Hydra Viper for quite a while. But he's got Pathogen Glands. He's adding his Flyer upgrade steadily. He's got Double Spire to max out on those so he can swap into Broodlords. Uh, ranged upgrades are well on the way. Let's see how quickly, even in this late game scenario, he remembers to start plus two range. Oh my god, Serral taking more than 20 seconds to remember something? Oh, crazy. But yeah, he just keeps coming in with these like attacks from, from different angles. And as the Terran, it's very hard to be properly set up on each side. You could argue that Maru <clears throat> should have just split his army 50-50. But uh, easier said than done, I guess. He does roll in the left at the same time. And plus three Banelings, pretty good units. Just going to click on that planetary, take that down. And these trades aren't fantastic. The thing is, what you'll find is in between these things, what you do is you open up angles for things like this, where suddenly you get a crazy amount of damage. A few cracklings get in, kill 10 SCVs. Crazy good trade. So the more chaos you create, the more movement as a Zerg player, the easier it is to break these scenarios. 
Um, I'm a big fan of going into like swarm hosts and, 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 and festers and like lots of spellcasters and doing this very fancy way. But I feel like Serral's way is actually a lot easier, even if you're not using the Vipers as well as him. Just splitting up a big Ultra Ling Bane Hydra army into two halves and just kind of poking it in and going, oh, he doesn't have that much army here, A move in. I mean, my heart's and then beating. as his my army shifts to the other side, my hands are shaking, but I'm still shooting. And I'm, I'm still, still getting headshots. And then you can come in from the other side as well uh, when your opponent's out of position. And that's what Serral keeps doing here is, once again, he says, hey, you're not fully set up here. Quick, come in. Just friggin' roll over the top with this crazy army. And look at this. The repair's a little bit late for Serral, uh, for Maru. And plus three cracklings. Take it down. And that's the moment where you go, look at that, look at that. He's got two cloak upgrades, but he doesn't have building armor. <laughs> Maru! absolutely have building armor at this stage of the game guys stops command centers dying to zerglings that easily uh but yeah these are the sort of trades you can kind of afford in uh in Serral's shoes he's being a few thousand resources less efficient but he just kind of keeps rolling in from different sides and opportunistically jumping in on stuff and this is something obviously you need a lot of experience to do super well but i think if you're not playing maru it's pretty easy to catch the Terran kind of unseaged or out of position nathanius thank you so much for that big 189 viewer raid my friend Appreciate it. So guys, we've got to finish up now as uh, we're going to fast forward through to the last uh, stages of this. See if I can show you guys another good fight uh, to finish it off. Even though, like I said, Sarah was way ahead and it was more the early game and the pristine precision, the formulaic nature of it that I wanted to talk about. And this is an army a lot of people struggle with. Just remember guys, if you have an overwhelming ground army, uh, usually you're in a pretty good spot. Now, he's actually gone for 18 Corruptors, because that's so many libs, but 63 Banelings, because Banelings are the most supply-efficient unit in the game. They only cost half the supply each. So even though they're not cost-efficient on their own, if they can clear a certain part of their army, in this case, almost every Marine and Ghost goes down, the Corruptors can take care of the air units. Now, the Ghosts actually did survive. And it looked like it was kind of a bad trade for Serral, and it indeed wasn't that great. It would have been a ton better if he'd flanked from behind with half of his army. But he simply remaxes on more Ling Bane, and he's like, nah, I'm, let's, you know, let's go. Still Ling counter attacking, still no economy for Maru because Serral's two, swing, two, two directional attacks just kept rolling in. And at this point, it's just waiting for Maru to try one more desperate push, which Serral will collapse on. And, uh, and then we'll be finishing up this little ep. So this ep's gone for quite a while. Um, as you can tell, it's very freeform. I watched the replay beforehand, and then I just go through and talk about all the sick little details of this shit. Where can I find this replay? You absolutely cannot find this replay anywhere, guys. I'm very lucky to have permission to do this sort of analysis. I'm not allowed to broadcast the whole tournament or anything, so we're just looking at little pieces of select matches here and there. I'm popping in and out. I'm not showing you the whole game from start to finish, but here we go, just Banelings rolling in. And yeah, When you've got an economy advantage, Banelings are just the best way to roll over. <laughs> it's very easy. Just control click those banes and roll them past the enemy. And, uh, whew, Mario has to tap out. So, I think a great little start to this series. Are we going to be looking at more of these replays? Absolutely. Uh, I might come back and even do Serral vs. Innovation as a separate show, separate little video. Um, I've been lucky enough to get permission to look at all the GSL vs. The World replays for this analysis, and I will keep doing so. We're going to look at Snats PVT. We're going to look at all the other cool things that have gone on. Let's answer some questions really quickly before I totally finish off the VOD. Is it worth attacking the SCVs repairing the planetary fortress, or is it better simply to attack the building? Uh, it depends on the scenario and Burke. Always, preferably, like with Banelings, it's easy. If your Banelings just kind of surround, you're going to hit the planetary and the, the SCVs at the same time, so it works out perfectly. Uh, but yeah, if you've got excess units that don't have surface area, it is worth sometimes giving them a shift click on the SCVs. If you're ever fighting a, a planetary fortress with just one or two Ultralisks, absolutely kill the, kill the SCVs first. So something I like to do is I try to micro my Ultralisk into the mineral line before it attacks the planetary. So when the SCVs start repairing, the cleave will naturally be killing most of the SCVs that are trying to repair. Um, so that works out pretty well. It's absolutely all going on YouTube, mate. We'll be looking at a lot more Serral games, some stats games, and some other stuff. Ari Shadow says, hello, my name is Ari. Hello, Ari. Um, and shout out to Ari's mum. Where can I find this replay? Already answered that one. He cancelled his Ling Speed to get his third down before the Reaper could hop on his third, says Equin Sutra. Oh my god, I didn't even realize that. 
Good point, dude. I did not notice that. What's your opinion on that move versus taking another base or just escorting the drone later? I think this base is a lot better on that map. Equinus Sutra, thank you for that pickup. I totally missed that. Um, I think that's a really cool move. If you see the Reapers heading straight to that base, definitely well worth it. Why not? Why not? Uh, great, great way to make sure you get that down on time. Kind of depends on the matter. If people aren't committing to blocking that third, you probably don't need to. You can just get the third a few seconds later. But if the Reaper is going to block it or an SCV is going to block it, absolutely worth delaying the link speed by 20 seconds or so to do that. Thank you guys for hanging out. And have you checked out Cyril's inject method and speed, says Chester MacArthur. Okay, so Eon Blue, my moderator, who's a semi-pro player, uh, he's been harassing Cyril at events. Not really harassing, no. He's been hanging out with Cyril a little bit and, 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 and asking him and watching him play first person, which I often don't get to do because I'm, I'm usually backstage casting. But uh, he told me that Cyril actually freely swaps between all three methods of injecting. In the early game, what he does is he uses my method. Camera location, box the queen, inject. Camera location, box the queen, inject. And he has his creep slash defense queens on a separate control group. That's what I advise everyone to do. I think this is the best method. I think it's clean. But he actually changes this throughout the game. And at some point, he does control group his injecting queens at some stages. And he will actually use camera hotkeys, but use the queen group. And I think it's just when he doesn't need a counterattack group. I don't know his exact times why, he, but apparently he uses all three. And Cyril like just talks about it in the most chill way ever. He's like, yeah, I mean, you just use this one when you need it and this one when you need it. And you're like, great. Thanks for that in-depth explanation. I love Cyril. He's great. But pro gamers aren't always the most forthcoming about why they do things. Um, and he does sometimes use the base camera method uh, with rapid fire as well. I believe he uses that. Um, apparently sometimes he uses rapid fire with creep tumors as well. Many pros I've talked to have said sometimes they rapid fire creep. Sometimes they manually go just button click, button click, button click. And it depends on how many tumors there are. Um, so yeah, with him injecting in the late game when he does it really fast, once he gets to the mid game onwards, I think he's always using the, the kind of spam method where he just spams through his bases, but he also puts every single queen on the injecting slash defense control group at that point. So what he does at that stage, and I fucking really hope I'm not butchering this because I'm doing this off the top of my head and it's somewhere in my Discord because I was asking him about it yesterday or this morning. <laughs> um, so he'll select that and he'll tell them all to inject like dozens of injects across all the hatcheries. But then when needed, he'll also use that control group to replace creep tumors and to bring them back to the front to help defending pushes or harassment when needed. Um, Cyril is one of the smoothest players at shifting what his control groups are used for in terms of like he's got those two main army groups he uses and he kind of shifts how they're used a lot. Um, I think his spellcaster key, which we saw used by the Vipers in that game, I think that's number two, number one is main army. Uh, his Viper hotkey is almost always the same though. So that's something which is, is cool to see. His spellcaster slash mutilist key seems to be very consistent. Um... So yeah, good stuff. Is there a benefit for multiple injects on the same hatch? Absolutely, Spenny. That's just a way to, to once you've missed some injects, to, to spend your energy. It's a, it's a great way to do it. Um, it just allows them to kind of queue up one after the other. All right, guys, thank you very much. Um, do you guys think people don't give credit to perfect macro decisions like what Cyril did and they only credit micro heavy wins? No, I think what people do though is they say Cyril just has more drones. Cyril just has more stuff. But realistically, to summarize, guys, what was the most impressive thing? There are two things about what Cyril does uh, consistently across all situations that allow him to be the best Zerg in the world. Number one, he scouts methodically and consistently. I've been joking about this in my casts because I'm so impressed by it that I can't help but laugh. I've been doing this for a year now watching Cyril. His Zerglings see everything. He never is without vision in ZVZ. And I've noticed the same thing in Pro against Protoss and Terran now. He's always got Lings not just probing for counterattacks, but he is constantly hunting. In that game, there was so much consistent scouting, the Overseer spying, the army moving out. He knew where the army was pushing. His army was pre-spread into multiple control groups before Maru was even pushed, uh, pushed in. He scouted the Banshee tech on the way, and... He had the perfect defensive setup, the fast lair, the spore in the main, the spore in the third, but not just that, he built an extra zoning overseer on the north, had two overlords spotting the main to get forward warning of banshees coming in there, and he used that overseer in the middle, which ended up getting the banshee kill. He always takes extra very small precautions that cost only APM and mental preparation, but they allow him to shut down his opponent's pressure that much harder. And he can do this every game because his scouting is so good. It is the fact that his defense is so good just through his positioning and his planning 
and the fact that he can do that so consistently because his scouting is so good. That is why Serral's a god. That is why he ends up with these amazing drone counts and he ends up rolling his opponents so confidently. Yes, there's a lot of other things he does very well. He's amazing at playing from behind, but that's the main gist of it. Lots of scouting, lots of reacting. You're not all going to play as well as him, but even by trying to imitate him in Zerg versus Zerg, I have noticed a massive increase in my skill as I just get better and better at scouting constantly and making informed decisions rather than saying, oh, it's too hard to scout constantly. I'm just going to build roaches right now because I don't know what's happening. Because of that, I'm taking a lot more kind of responsibility for my wins and losses. I feel like it's more in my control than ever before. So I think the more you guys can scout uh, and take kind of take that inspiration from Serral with how the defense is so well prepared, the scouting is so organized and how he understands all the stages of what his opponent should be doing and what he needs to check for. Thanks for watching, guys. I hope you enjoyed this first return of the analysis-style pig dailies. We're going to be doing the rest of the GSL versus the World series over the next week or two. See you guys then.